Hey, welcome to The Table Church Online. My name is Jesse, and I'm one of the staff members here at The Table, and we are so glad that you have tuned in today. If this is your first time checking us out, we are especially glad to have you joining with us. In just a second, our pastor, Cody, is going to share with us, and I want to encourage you to stick around uh, when he's done, because there's a couple of things that I want to share with you. So let's hear from our pastor. Welcome to The Table. My name is Cody, and I am so glad that you are joining with us today or um, online tonight if... Uh, if you're uh, tuning in with us um, at 6 tonight, 
Um, before we uh, get started in the scripture today, um, normally I just dive right in. We'd have had you guys remain standing and I would have just read um, the scripture. But on the third Sunday of the month, we like to do a finance update. And because um, it's January, we're going to kind of give you a recap of our 2020 finances. So um, while you're uh, turning in, the, in your Bibles, if you have Bibles with you, um, great. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 17. Um, but while you're turning there, we're going to go over our um, finance update. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. The words are going to be on the screen for you here um, in just a little bit. But be prepared. I'm probably going to have you stand back up in honor of God's word um, as soon as we get done with this. All right. Um, so uh, 2020 finance update. Here we go. So our budgeted tithes and offerings, what we budgeted for us to take in for the year of 2020 was $185,000. And here's what we actually, what you and I, what we as a church actually brought in. $184,247.29. That is pretty dead gum good. I mean, you got to hand it to our finance team. They kind of nailed it. All right, when, when we talk about budgeting and stuff, they were, that's pretty close. I mean, that, that is good enough for the prices right right there, all right? So, um, but we are also still a church, um, so we are supported by um, other partners, primarily Mullins Baptist Association. Um, that was the, um, um, we're entering into the final years of that partnership, and they um, sent us money, and plus we got a little bit of extra from outside support. That amount came to $52,622.04. Penny. So, um, our budgeted income for the year was two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, but our actual income was two hundred and thirty-six thousand eight hundred sixty-nine dollars and thirty cents. Now, get this: because of COVID and because we were shut down, uh, basically, I think in like early March of last year. I think like March eighth was like the last time we met until like November of this year. So we budgeted like $36,000 to pay rent here in the school, and we didn't have to pay that. So that's why our expenses were considerably lower. So our expenses were only $170,076.93. But we are also a generous church, and we want to give. We were planted out of the offering plates of other churches, and so we want to help plant churches as well. So we give money to the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention, to Acts 29, um, back to... We give money back to Mullins as they want to continue to help plant churches. And we also give um, money, a small amount, to our local um, missions association here called Thrive Network. And that amount totaled $20,267.20. So what happened with all of that money? Well, here's the thing. We got to baptize five of our friends. Five of our friends professed faith in Christ and were baptized, followed him in believer's baptism. And those are always, always good times. So, yeah, good stuff. Um, we had, even despite only meeting for just a few months of the year, um, we saw 15 people take steps to start serving in on teams, to start using their time, their gift, their talents, and stuff to serve um, on teams. We had 26 people um, plug into home groups that, whether they started on Zoom or then they moved in person, we had 26 people that said, I want to be a part of this community. We had 16 people that said, we're going to start... Uh, we're going to become givers, and that means like planned regular giving. Like they, they gave, and they started contributing to the mission of this, and we ended the year with 48 members of the church, which some of you, um, you're kind of like returning members, and so you, you should have gotten like a, a new membership covenant for you to kind of renew your membership, and if you didn't get that, see um, Lori or Tiffany back there at the info table on the way out, and we'll make sure and get that, and you can sign that. Tell us what group you're going to, what team you're serving on, and, 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 and re-up, like re-member with us, re-member. So, all right, so that's our finance update um, for 20. Uh, 20, 2020 may have been a dumpster fire, but financially it was pretty good for us. And um, we're, we're wanting to carry that momentum. And as we can meet back again, and, and we want to continue to welcome people into the table, welcome people into God's family. We want to take and, and help our guests become part of God's family. We want to make disciples so that we can continue to plant churches um, all over the valley and all over wherever God um, has for us. So um, with all of that said, um, we're going to go ahead and ask you to stand now as we read God's word and jump into um, Hebrews chapter 12. We're in week three. We're looking at verses 12 through 17. Here's what God's word says. Therefore, 
Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's pray. Lord God, you have promised that your word will go out and accomplish that which you have purposed for it to do. God, we claim that this morning. God, we ask that you would convict us where we need conviction, that you would encourage us where we need encouragement, and we pray that you would draw your people to yourself. We pray that you would save your people. God, grow your family today. Strengthen your church. God, let your kingdom come. And we ask it in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Um, so here's the big idea that we're going to do. This, this text is filled with um, about three different just imperative commands, that just things that it tells the people in this church to do. Um, and, and kind of the big one is where it lands um, down there in verse 14 where he says, Strive for peace and holiness um, w- without which no one will see the Lord. So here's the big idea. Strive for peace with man. Strive for holiness with God um, as a follower of Jesus, knowing that as a follower of Jesus, you have peace with God and you have Christ's holiness. Like, you, you have both of those, but you're still supposed to strive for them. Now, I realize that that's kind of counterintuitive because you would say, well, why should I strive for something that I already have, right? Why would, why would I do that? that that's kind of like what the logical, but, but you got to understand, you're not, you, you're not perfect yet. I mean, just look at your neighbor. You can go ahead, give them the stink eye because they ain't perfect either, okay? Like, we're not, we're not perfect yet, but yet... We, we've been adopted into God's family, so we're accepted. We have peace with God. We're not an enemy with God. And, and, and yet we're, we're still accepted with Him, even though we're not perfectly holy. I mean, Peter quotes it. Jesus says it. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. And yet we know that we're not holy. So how do we... We know that there's multiple ex- exhortations for us to, to strive and to pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. But how do we get there? If we're not holy, how do we get there? All right, so that's what we want to kind of lay out this morning. And we're going to start um, kind of in the backwards with this text. I'm going, to, I'm going to just kind of run through verses 15 through 17 and talk about this guy named Esau because as the, the Scripture um, author is, is laying this out, he gives Esau as kind of this example. And the people in this text, in, the, in this audience, they would have known exactly who Esau was. But I realize that most of us are Gentiles, we're not Jewish, and we may not know who Esau was. But these people, they were primarily Jewish. They would have known exactly who Esau was. They would have known that Esau was Isaac's son. And they would have known that he was a twin with another guy named Jacob. And they would have known of this crazy story about his birth. That like literally when Rebekah was in labor with them, like the first one to reach his hand out of the womb was Jacob. But then his hand came back. And then, it, then, then Esau was born. He was the firstborn. Which you think, well, that's not a big deal. But in that scripture, the firstborn got all of the blessings, which is going to come to grips later on in this story in Genesis 25 and 27. They got the lion's share of the blessing. They would have gotten the lion's share of the inheritance. But the Bible says that as they were born, that it literally, that Esau came out first, but that Jacob came out clutching his heel. And that was kind of a, a, a sign. And God spoke to Rebekah and says, listen, the older is going to serve the younger. But Isaac, he didn't, li- he didn't listen to that. Now, we don't know why. We can go in there and psychoanalyze it and stuff. But, you know, 
you know, he, he was born after his brother and there was kind of some tur- turmoil in, in his dad's house with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and all that. I mean, you talk about some awkward family Christmases going on. I mean, the patriarchs, I mean, there is some juicy stuff going on. Like, don't, don't spend your time watching Days of Our Lives or Breaking Bad. Just go read the Old Testament because there is some jacked up stuff in there. All right? And this story is one of them. So Rebecca, she's sharing with Isaac that, hey, the, the chosen one is going to be Jacob. And Isaac's not having it. He's not having it. He, he favors Esau. But Rebecca favors Jacob. So how do you like that for this sibling rivalry going on and parental favoritism? I mean, you talk about nepotism on a whole nother level. It was just, it was some messed up stuff. And so they, they go along there and, and Esau, he really doesn't care about the things. He really doesn't care about the God uh, that Isaac worships or the God that his grandfather Abraham worshipped. He's just, he's just a man who liked to hunt and fish. Right? And he's a hairy man, and he's red-colored. He kind of looked like a orangutan. That's how I remember it, you know. Uh, well, not remember it. It's how I picture it. I wasn't there. So, I mean, I'm old, but I ain't that old. So, so he's, you know, he's out there, and one day he comes in from, from hunting, and he's famished, he's starved, and he's like, and he sees Jacob, who's kind of a quiet man. He, you know, stays in the house. He's, he's you know, having like the pampered chef parties with his mom and stuff like that. And uh, he comes in. And he's like, he's like, give me some of that stew. And Jacob, being like the schemer and the deceiver, getting leverage over him, he goes, sell me your birthright. And, and Esau's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, what, what good is my birthright to me if I die? I'm about to die here, which he probably wasn't going to die. But it does tell us a little bit about these two boys' character, that Esau is a man who is a slave to his appetites. And Jacob is a man who will totally take advantage of you. Now, I want to tell you right now, just because if you're sitting here listening to this, because you may be able to picture yourself in this story, you may be able to picture someone else in this story. Um, Listen, the only people that God works with are flawed people. Both of these boys are deeply flawed. And you know where they got it? From their parents. Listen, your kids are deeply flawed. And you know where they got it? I'll give you three guesses. They get it from you. And you got it from your parents. Like, we're we're deeply flawed. Like, like we all passed on this, this genetic malfunction called sin. We're sinners by nature and by choice. And these this family's not any different. The Bible just does us the the favor, I guess, of just laying it all out there for us. We see it in all of its truth. It's not saying that what they did was right or wrong. It's just showing that God redeems in spite of all of that. All right? So, we go through the story. By the way, this story is found in Genesis chapter 26 and 27. I would encourage you um, this week, this is a, um, we're going to do a little bit of digging here, just looking at this, um, expose some of these roots because it says See to it that no one fails to obtain, attain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. So, be encouraged. God only works through flawed people. Read these two chapters this week. Genesis chapter 25, Genesis chapter 27. Read them with your family um, and ask questions about it. Ask your kids questions. Wrestle with it. Like, what would, put yourself in the story. You know, what would you have done if you were Isaac and your wife told you who was supposed to receive the blessing. What would you have done? Would you have listened to her? Would you have remained hard-headed and stubborn like you do whenever she's trying to give you directions on where to go? What would you have done? Or put yourself, you know, what would you have done if you were Isaac or Rebecca and dad wouldn't listen and you knew that God had said to this thing but, but dad's not listening? What would you have done? How would you have reacted if you were Esau? And you were cheated out of, out of this birthright. Because that's what eventually happens. Eventually, Isaac calls Esau in and says, Hey, my time is short. I'm about to die. Go, go out. Catch, catch this, my, my favorite game. Come in, prepare it for me. And as you give it to me, I will give you the blessing. And the idea was that he was going to give him not just the blessing of the, of the firstborn, but he was going to give him everything. He was going to totally cut Jacob out. You know, 
It's not like they are working separate jobs. They're all there in one campsite. Rebecca overhears this, waits for Esau to go, calls Jacob and says, Hey, here's what's going down, buddy. Here's what I need you to do. I'm going to prepare this, this, this feast. I need you to go over there and put on this goat suit. Because your brother is a hairy man. And you're not that hairy. So we really got to pull this thing off. You go in there and pretend to be Esau. That way dad will give you the blessing. And this thing that God has told us will come true. So now put yourself in the story. Imagine yourself talking about this this week. Um, Ask your kids this question. What would you have done, Junior, if mom tells you to put on a goat suit and go lie to your dad? Just put, put yourself in that situation. What would you have done? Like, it's bad enough that you got to put on a goat suit. It's not even like the pink furry bunny suit that, you know, the kid in the Christmas story wore. It's not even, it's, not, it's, a, it's a goat suit. And then as if that's not bad enough, like, Mom, you really want me to go lie to Dad? You want me to try to pretend to be someone I'm not? You see, it's, it has relevance for us today, right? I mean, I realize there's not a whole lot of you going around putting goat suits on, but I guarantee you there's more than one of us in here that are trying to pretend something to be something that we're not. So, talk about it. Read over Genesis 25 and 27. It's so good. He, the, the scripture here goes on and tells us that Esau was unholy. That's what that he's the example. He, it's, he's, Esau is the warning that he is holding out to this group of people. Says, "Don't be like that guy." Now, of course, you would say, "Well, it doesn't sound like we should be like any of them. <laughs> they're, like they're all bad." Yeah, they are. <laughs> but but they some of them obtain grace, and, and Esau doesn't. And Esau is the, he just he sold his birthright for a single meal. He was a slave to his appetites. He and he had this root of bitterness. You say, "Well." What do you mean Esau had a root of bitterness? Of course he had a root of bitterness. He got swindled out of that thing. And the Bible does say that even afterwards when he found that out, that he sought it with tears. He goes, he goes, Dad, is there nothing left for me? Is there no blessing? Now here's the crazy thing. Tim Keller says this, and I think he's right, that Isaac could have went ahead and blessed him, but he didn't. That Isaac finally came to terms with God's will. He could have just taken it back as the patriarch of the family and said, no, 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 that's, a, that's cheat, I call foul, and, and done it. But he didn't. He said, okay, I, maybe this is what the Lord is, is doing. And Esau is bent out of shape about We see it actually in Genesis chapter 27, verses 41 through 42. It says, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. Now think about that. That he got the blessing, he wasn't happy for him because he got swindled out of it. He hated his own brother. He hated him because of it. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. So Isaac is gone. He's dead. He says, so the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Basically what he's saying is, during the morning time, and where all the family's coming together, and they, they, this specific time, I'm not going to touch him then, but he's nursing this grudge. He's got this root of bitterness. Verse 42, but the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Like, that's how he's comforting himself. He's thinking of your demise. Like, when he has trouble sleeping at night, he thinks about his hands around your neck. Yeah, he was a little bitter. Let me ask you this. Do you ever comfort yourself with the thought of like bad things happening to those who you're angry with? I didn't expect any hands to go up there because it's like church and everything, but we do that, right? Like we, we know that just because we're saved doesn't mean that our sinful nature goes away. We know that we still deal with this. We know we still deal with, with anger. If so, you have a root of bitterness. You're demanding payment. You're, you're, by thinking through the, those things about bad things happening, 
to those people who you're, who've wronged you, who've uh, deceived you, who have out-schemed you or um, cheated you, you, you you're, you're, you're demanding payment. And here's the thing, you're never going to get it. You're ne- if, you're, if, you're, if you're thinking about how you can get them back or you're rehearsing conversations about what you're going to say to them, listen, you're never going to get that payment back. You're not going to make them feel bad enough for what they did to you. You're not, you're not going to get that payment. Esau didn't. He didn't get that payment. Jacob left. He listened to his mom and he left. Esau did not get his retribution. Jacob got away with it. He escaped. And the people who've wronged you are probably going to do the same thing. So, what a cheerful message this morning, right? So how do you deal with this? Now, keep in mind, you say, well, what's the context? What does all this have to do with what's going on in the book of Hebrews? This is a group of people who are primarily Jewish background believers that have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but in the place that they're from, most of their family, most of their friends, most everybody that they associate with are Jewish. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure for them to quit doing this Jesus thing and come back into Judaism, where it's familiar, where you know what the family traditions are, where nobody's going to be mad at you, where you're not going to have this awkwardness because you are doing life differently than they do. They're, he's saying, yeah, some of them have been hurt. Some of them have been hurt and wronged by family. And that's why he starts in verse 12, He says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but may be healed. This idea, there's there's three imperatives that are just boom, 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 right in a row. So this author has spent most of the letter in chapters 1 through 11 just describing who Jesus is. Chapters 1 through 11 are giving us the why behind these imperatives that he gives us in chapters 12 and 13. Here's why we do church. Here's why we follow Jesus. Here's why we do all these things. Now, here, you've got to do it. And the first one is lift. Lift your drooping hands. It's literally like a a sign of of physical motion. I remember one time I was doing this CrossFit workout, which I know it doesn't look like I've ever done a CrossFit workout, but I promise I did one one time. And... um, (laughs) And I was, and, and it was terrible. And it was long, and like we had to, and it was out. It wasn't even like at a CrossFit gym. It's just some guy that had it in his garage, and it was out on the country road in Oklahoma. And the, it was the last part of it. You had to go run like half a mile, like some stupid amount. You know, like why would we? Why do people have run anymore? You have cars. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, so I'm, I'm out there running, and it, we've already done like a million squats and four million push-ups, and I don't know how many million pull-ups. It's just bad. <laughs> It was just exhausted, like everything felt like it was just going to fall off. And I was out there running back, and literally like my legs just went numb. Like I thought I was going to fall. It was just, just weak knees, drooping hands. Like I couldn't lift my arms enough to run like this. It was, it was kind of like running like, like, like Dwight Schrute's cousin Moe's, you know, with his hands down at the side. It was just, it was just bad. And I remember my, my buddy Carl, who's like just you know, like built like a Greek god, you know, he came out there and like runs with me, which was encouraging and also demoralizing all at the same time because he's done the same amount of work and now he's doing extra. So anyway, but he says, lift your drooping hands. And so I, I remember like, just lift your hands, just lift your arms while you're running, just lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees. The weak knees is kind of like a universal metaphor for fear and it literally means per- paralyzed. It's the idea from Isaiah. It comes straight from Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3, where he's talking about how the ransomed of God are going to come back into Zion one day and that God will come to save them in a, in a way that's much more glorious than the way Carl came to rescue me out there on the road. He also goes on, he says, make straight. This is another imperative. He goes, make straight the paths. It's this idea of clearing the path. It's removing obstacles. Obviously, they didn't have a whole lot of pavement back then. It was just a lot of um, you know, trails and stuff like that. And, and often, 
oftentimes rocks got scuffed and put there. He says, like, just clear the paths, move the rocks out of the way. And it's the idea of, like, just don't twist your ankle. That's what he, that's what he says. Look at what he says. He says, to make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And so the, the imagery here is, like, as we remove obstacles, we're removing sin. And that's what he talks about earlier in chapter 12. He goes, let us you know, turn away from the sin which so easily entangles us. So it's rem- sin is now pictured as an obstacle that we remove. And not, no, not just that we remove on our own in this kind of weird, Americanized, wet, very Western, um, self-centric um, Christianity where we have to do it all on our own. But no, it's in community. The idea here, like it's literally a plural saying you remove these obstacles for other people. Like we're helping remove, remove sin from one another's lives. And we do this for those who are wavering in the faith because in this context, there were people in this community of believers that were just so tired, so weary, so um, burned out, so hurt by, by, by persecution and through the suffering they were enduring because of the name of Jesus that there were some of them that were saying, I don't know if I can go on. I just think it's easier to go back to this other way. And the author is encouraging the community here. says, don't let them do that. Don't let them suffer on their own, but be there for them. We need one another. We're not meant to do this Christian thing alone. In the Genesis, when he creates Adam, he, he, he says, I mean, God, it, over and over he goes, and that was good, and that was good, and that was good, and that was good. He just over and over and over. And then he looks at Adam, and he's, he goes, and it's not good for man to be alone. So he made a helper for him. Now, for you and I to look at something and say it's not good, well, that's one thing. But for the God of the universe to look at something and say not good, that's a problem. It's not good for us to be alone. The author is telling the church here he goes help one another remove obstacles for one another point them out for one another that way they don't get all twisted up and fall and take on more scuffs and scrapes he goes on he says strive for two things he goes strive for peace and strive for holiness so one is kind of horizontal strive for peace with everyone but also strive for holiness which that has more to do with like the vertical axis of the relationship and we we remember we 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 know that these these axes are good uh, barometers or good gauges for us because it kind of reminds us of the uh, the first commandment or the most important the great commandment that jesus gives us when jesus was tested once says what's the greatest commandment he says love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength that's the vertical axes and he goes and the second is like it he didn't stop there love your neighbor as yourself If we can love our neighbor like ourselves, that goes a long way towards making peace with one another, right? If we can love them the way that we want to be loved. So in the idea of of peace, we have the capacity to be at peace with our neighbors and with those who have even wronged us, the Jacobs, the swindlers in our lives, or the Esau's in our lives who bear grudges, against us we're able to have peace primarily because we have peace with god and that peace kind of trumps all of the other ones but then on the on the vertical axis this idea of holiness holiness is like our preparation for heaven like you realize that some of the sins not some all of the sins that you have now you're you're not going to have those in heaven now I don't know about you, but I long for the day that I'm just not going to be tempted anymore or give in to temptation. That is going to be a good, good day. It's our preparation for heaven. Those who have been perfected in God's sight through Christ are being perfected now. Those who have been perfected in Christ are being perfected now. It's not that you strive for holiness to kind of measure up and to earn points with God. It's that you strive for holiness, to strive for Christ-likeness because you have been made perfect in His sight. 
That's a very, very different motivation. If you're motivated by the first one to try to earn up or to measure up, it's exhausting and you'll wear yourself out. You'll grow weary and eventually you'll give up. But if you blow it and you confess and you repent and you and you run back to Christ, knowing that he's accepted you, knowing that you're adopted into his family, knowing that there's nothing you can say or do that would ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that there's no condemnation for you, then that spurs more confession, more repentance. So holiness is our preparation for heaven, but it's also necessary for our perseverance because sin never stops. At least not on this side of Jesus coming back. Sin's just ne- it's just going to be relentless. It's always going to be crouching at our door, always knocking, always trying to tempt us. So verse 15, he talks about this root of bitterness, he says, which defiles others. Here's the thing. Sin not only never stops, but sin never stops where you want it to. It always goes on and, and does a worse job. It just never stops right there. It always goes in and affects some other area of your life. Last thing is holiness. Holiness now matters eternally. So we live with eternity in mind. We don't just, we're not just slaves to our appetites like Esau was. We're not just living for the here and now. When I say just living for the here and now, I don't mean just like living for tomorrow or living for next month. I mean just living for this life. Now, this is the thing. Here, here's the thing. When, we, when it talks about no root of bitterness, he, understand this. The Bible is not saying you can never be angry. I think this is a lie that's been perpetuated upon the Christian church, and it's made things just simply unbearable. Anger in and of itself is not sinful. You want to know how I know that? God gets angry. Jesus got angry. Paul tells the church, be angry, yet do not sin. But but we we think about it in in these ways that we think, oh no, anger is a sin. No, anger itself is not a sin. Where it gets twisted is when we get angry about the things that God's not angry about, and when we don't get angry about the things that God is angry about. I'll give you an example. When was the last time that you just got enraged and furious about child trafficking? Yesterday, okay, some, great. I didn't expect that answer, but that's great. Awesome, you're on the right track. Okay, now, other question. When was the last time you really got ticked off in traffic because somebody cut you off? You see what I'm saying? Like we, we get it twisted up. We, we get angry sometimes about things that God's not all that angry about. Or we don't get angry about, we don't think about. Here's the thing. What you, what you get angry about, what really sets you off, really does reveal what you love really does reveal what you love what you deeply care about okay now this is again just an aside um here's where my anger will come out whenever my god of comfort is threatened whenever i get inconvenienced that's where i'll get so when you when you find yourself getting angry here's here's what you need to ask What am I defending? What what am I defending against? What is that thing that I why why am I getting so angry? What am I defending? That'll tell you where your where your loves are. And often, you know, our loves are misaligned. So all of this is in the context of enduring suffering and hardship and even persecution as discipline from the Lord. That's what we talked about last week. It's discipline from the Lord. The hardships, the trials. Don't, don't think that God hates you. It's discipline from the Lord. He's, he's molding you, shaping you, making you into what He wants you to be. Why? Because He's a good, gracious God. He's a Father. And this suffering, this, this, this discipline that you're having to endure, that's a good, gracious gift from this good, gracious God. And we know that from Esau's nephew. You see, Jacob went on. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them, whose name was Joseph. And guess what? Jacob didn't learn too much from his days of being 
of, of parental and sibling uh, favoritism. He ends up having these 12 kids through four different women. I told you it was jacked up. And get this, they all lived in the same place. They all lived like in the same little encampment. Wasn't like one lived, you know, over in, you know, Tekoa and one lived over here. No, no, no. They all lived in the same place, all traveled together. I mean, awkward family Christmas. And they're just comparing and just trying to vying for Jacob's love, about just spitting out kids left and right. It's just, it's messed up. He finally has his favorite kid through his favorite wife, Rachel, and he names him Joseph. And he's the youngest, and the rest of his brothers, they hate him. And so they just attack him. They throw him into a well. And then they sell him into slavery. And they tell his dad that he died. Like, you've heard the jokes like, yeah, we're going to kill you and tell dad you died. But that really happened. They really did that. They, they sold him off to the slave. And what happens? Joseph ends up becoming second in command of the known world at that time. And... His brothers come back. The dream that he has comes true. These dreams that he said, the, all the stars are going to bow before mine. The, the sheaves are all going to bow before my sheep. They come back and they do it. They don't even know who he is. And now Joseph is faced. Like, what's he going to do? He forgives. He reinstates. He brings them back. He reconciles. He didn't let that root of bitterness come up in his life. And you say, well, yeah, if you were second in command, you could do the same thing. No, because... He didn't let a root, a root of bitterness spring up in his life even when he was in jail. When he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Whenever he was forgotten by the baker. He didn't, for, he, he didn't let a root of bitterness spring up then. He genuinely pursued relationship with his brothers. He trusted in God. Despite his circumstances and this enabled him to pursue peace with his brothers so this idea it's grace driven effort it's grace driven pursuit of peace and holiness we pursue peace because we've been given peace with god through christ we pursue holiness in our personal lives because we've been given the holiness of christ that is what we has been imputed to us that that is our standing before god and we're not lacking in any of that so Joseph is this Christ figure. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will be desperate, it'll be despairingly frustrated if you hear this today and leave here trying to forgive in your own effort and by your own power. What you have to do is you have to see yourself as not Joseph, but as the brothers in desperate need of forgiveness. You have to see yourself as as the one that is in need of grace. And then you'll in turn prepare yourself to give grace. If you don't see yourself as the one in need of grace, you'll be very, very hesitant to give grace to others. Okay? So, thankfully, Christ gives us all of that. He gives us peace with God. He gives us grace that is without end, without measure. And He gives us His righteousness. His holiness that we have. We don't deserve it, but if we've placed our hope and trust in Jesus, we have it. And that fuels us to repent of bitterness and to strive with peace and to repent of sin and to strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So, we don't come before God on the basis of our ability to forgive, but upon Christ's ability to forgive and by drinking deeply from god's grace we poison the roots of bitterness that are in our lives roots are below the surface often they're invisible but if you drink deep from god's grace that seeps down in and poisons the roots of bitterness that we have in our lives so drink deeply today we're going to have a time of communion. Um, the way we do it here at our church is um, there are communion cups when you came in. We take that little cracker and we take that knowing that this is Christ's life, His body given for us, His perfect righteousness imputed to us. And we take and we drink that juice knowing that it's Christ's 
death on the cross, His shed blood that makes a way and pays for all of our sin. And so we, tra- we, we drink deeply of those things, remembering what Christ has done. And then when we're ready, we stand and we sing. We give God praise. Despite our circumstances, despite our trials, despite suffering, we praise. We praise Him. We talk to Him. We tell Him how great He is, how needy we are, and how glad we are to be a part of His family. So I'm going to pray for you. We'll let you take communion. And then we invite you to sing when you're ready, to stand and to sing and celebrate this gracious, holy, peace-giving God. Lord, move among your people now. God, may we drink deep from the well of grace. May you poison the roots of bitterness in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' good, good name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Cody, for that encouraging word. If you want to get connected at The Table or learn more about our church, I want to encourage you to check out our website at thetablephx.com. Or if you're in the area and you'd like to worship with us in person, we meet every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. at Arrowhead Elementary School at 75th Avenue and Union Hills. We hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.